The more I watch Frozen 2, the more I like it. I'm warming up to it. I'm warming to Frozen. When I first saw the film in theaters in 2019, I was really disappointed with it. It felt convoluted and rushed. The songs all felt like B-sides tracks cut from the first film. And I bristled a bit at the depiction of the North Uldra, an in-universe stand-in for the Sami people of Northern Europe. But in the intervening four years, my opinion of the film has softened somewhat, and I find myself appreciating a lot of the more ambitious elements of the narrative, even if I don't always feel like they stuck the landing. And the songs have grown on me. Most of them, anyway. After that first time I saw Frozen 2, I actually started writing an essay about my problems with the film, but ended up scrapping it because I didn't like just complaining about things. I decided then and there that I just wasn't going to do thing bad content on my channel. And here I am four years later in two pretty well received thing bad videos deep into my channel and I think I'm ready to talk about Frozen 2. But you know my feelings have evolved and this isn't so much a thing bad video as a thing messy video. Thing complicated. Thing valiant attempt. Thing nuance. I've been accused of ruining things or being offended, and I just want to make it clear right out the gate that that is not my intention or my outlook when it comes to media criticism. I've always been the kind of person that immediately runs to TV tropes when I finish a piece of media. I read reviews after I've watched a film. This is fun for me, and it enhances my enjoyment of media, even when I'm dealing with things that I didn't like as much. And I hope it does for you too. I don't want to ruin anything for anyone. If anything, I hope just talking about the strengths and flaws make people appreciate both this film and others in the Disney canon a bit more. I want this to be a very nuanced look at a film that is by no means perfect, but still has a lot going for it. So with that said, let's talk about Frozen 2. Shortly after the first Frozen film was released and made roughly a gajillion dollars and garnered dozens of awards, including two Academy Awards, the question of a sequel was raised. Frozen was kind of a natural choice for a sequel. Aside from the aforementioned gajillion dollars in awards, the film centered around two princess characters who spent the majority of the film separated by both emotional and physical distance, but who came together in the end. And one of them has ice powers. And I guess also the power to create life? So a sequel, a continuation of their story, would provide an opportunity to show Anna and Elsa really working together and to show how Elsa's abilities mature and grow now that she can control them through the power of sisterly love or whatever. The creative team behind the first Frozen film, headed by directors Jennifer Lee and Chris Buck and producer Peter Del Vecco, also suggested in 2014 that they'd like to continue working together on another Frozen-related project. But Walt Disney Studios chairman Alan F. Horn stated that there would be no immediate plans for a sequel, as the company was focused on turning the first film into a Broadway musical, as it had for other animated Disney giants like The Lion King and Beauty and the Beast. But Disney COO and sex pest John Lasseter, recognizing that Frozen had real franchise potential and that Frozen fever wasn't dying down anytime soon, authorized production on a short titled uh, Frozen Fever, headed by the original creative team. During production on Frozen Fever, the creative team, headed by Lee and Buck, started to seriously discuss the idea of a feature-length sequel and what would make for the most satisfying ending for the characters. They landed on an endpoint with Anna being crowned Queen of Arendelle and Elsa being free. It's quite sweet how much the creatives on Frozen care about the characters, especially Anna and Elsa. In the six-part documentary on the making of Frozen 2, into the Unknown, making Frozen 2. Don't watch it, it's not worth your time. It's very clear that Lee and Buck and their massive team of writers and animators think of these characters like they're babies. And given that happy endings are a certainty in any Disney film, I think it's very cute that their first concern was that the girls got the right one. So in March of 2015, Bob Iger, John Lasseter, and Josh Gad, for some reason, announced a feature-length sequel to Frozen at the annual Disney shareholder meeting. The original cast and production team all returned for the sequel, although Alison Schrader had to be brought on to assist Jennifer Lee in 2018 after she replaced John Lasseter as COO of animation due to some 
allegations of workplace misconduct. Don't worry about him, though. He's now producing Disney knockoffs for Apple TV+. Plus. Good old Tim Apple. Kristen Anderson Lopez and Robert Lopez, the husband-wife songwriting duo responsible for all of the first film songs, including the inescapable toddler Macarena, Let It Go, returned for the second film as did Christoph Beck as composer for the rest of the film's music and underscoring. A large part of the animation team from the original Frozen film also returned, and they took advantage of technological advancements in the intervening years to really improve the look of the film. And it is beautiful. For all of my criticisms of the story, the animation is some of the richest, most detailed computer-generated animation I've ever seen. Look at the water! Look at the hair! Look at the fucking details on the textiles! And six years after the first film, because animation takes a very long time, on November 7th, 2019, we got this. Don't you know there's part of me that loves to go Into the unknown Into the unknown like the first Frozen film, Frozen 2 begins with a flashback to Anna and Elsa's childhood. Anna and Elsa's father, King Agnar, tells them a bedtime story about the Enchanted Forest, a forest protected by spirits of air, fire, water, and earth. The Enchanted Forest was protected by the Northolder people, a tribe of non-magical people who lived in harmony with the Enchanted Forest and took advantage of its gifts. The Northolder promised the people of Arendelle friendship. As a gift of peace, King Runard, Anna and Elsa's grandfather, built the North Older people a dam to strengthen their waters. King Runard, young Prince Agnar, and a bunch of Arendellian soldiers travel to the Enchanted Forest to unveil the dam and sign a treaty with the North Uldra. But the North Uldra attack the Arendellians, a fight breaks out, and King Runard is killed. The spirits of the forest are enraged and vanish, enclosing the Enchanted Forest in an impenetrable wall of mist. Prince Agnar is knocked unconscious but rescued by an unknown savior with a beautiful voice, a la his distant cousin Prince Eric. King Agnar tells Anna and Elsa that the forest could wake again and that they must be prepared for whatever danger it may bring. Then Anna and Elsa's mother, Queen Iduna, sings them a lullaby about a magic river called Atahalin, said to hold all the answers about the past. The lullaby is called All is Found and it slaps and Evan Rachel Wood, who voices Iduna, sounds lovely singing it. Three years after the first film, Elsa begins hearing voices. Well, a voice that is Kulning, singing an ancient Swedish cattle call. It's autumn in Arendelle, and the kingdom celebrates a kind of Thanksgiving analog, and Anna sings to Olaf about change and constancy. This song is called Some Things Never Change, and it's incredibly mid. I always skip it when it comes up in the Disney shuffle. There's actually an alternate track as an album outtake called Home that I think is a much better song. But, you know, it does what the first song in a musical is supposed to do. It sets the status quo and establishes some of the main character's wants. Elsa senses change on the horizon, but she's afraid to lose what she has. Kristoff is planning on proposing to Anna. The Arendellians repeat the phrase, our flag will always fly several times. You know, that idea is going to be challenged right away. And Anna, I guess, is just, just straight chilling. She got what she wanted in the first movie and she doesn't really want for anything more. Which, as an Anna stan, is a little disappointing. You know, she seemed like the type who liked going on adventures, but sure. After the not-Thanksgiving feast, Anna, Elsa, Kristoff, Sven, and Olaf retire to the castle and play a game of charades, which Elsa sucks at. You got this, Elsa. Hmm. Anytime. Just, just do it with your body. Uh, nothing. Air. When Anna tries to mime the word villain, everyone reminds us of Hans from the last movie, a character who is not in this film and has nothing to do with it. Don't worry, though. This won't be the last time this movie reminds us of the first one. Elsa is distracted and heads off to bed early. Kristoff attempts to take advantage of his alone time with Anna to propose, but she unknowingly blows him off to go see what's wrong with Elsa. Anna notes that Elsa only wears their mother's scarf when something is wrong and comforts her sister by singing some of their mother's lullaby. They fall asleep, but Elsa is awoken by the voice in the middle of the night and sings her call to adventure song, a let it go analog called Into the Unknown. There's a very theatrical little light show during the song with a preview of the spirits of water, earth, fire, and air. A lot of this movie feels very theatrical. 
theatrical. Like they were very aware of the fact that the Frozen musical would be on Broadway by the time the movie was finished and that there is precedent for musical sequels. Like someone was like, well, if Phantom of the Opera can do it. (laughs) At the end of the song, a bunch of ice diamonds appear with the symbols for earth, fire, water, and air on them. And then the spirits of the elements begin attacking Arendelle. The fire leaves their lanterns, the water leaves their fountains, the wind whips, and there's an earthquake. The entire kingdom evacuates to the cliffs around Arendelle, and Elsa tells Anna that she awoke the magical spirits of the enchanted forest. All of this happens so quickly, and the logical leap is so big from call to adventure slash I want song that is still just vague enough that we can ask Panic at the Disco to do a cover of it, to I've awoken the spirits of the enchanted forest that I honestly, I didn't fully understand what was happening until the third or fourth rewatch of this movie. You have to really be paying attention to King Agnar's line about the forest waking again during the prologue and to this like rushed line that Elsa has during the Arendelle apocalypse for it not to feel like you're missing about 10 logical steps. And even then it still feels pretty clunky. It doesn't help that the fire is pink. I couldn't really tell that it was fire without the Elsa line. Like it just looked like pink magic. The sequences that felt rushed and the logical leaps where I felt like I was missing some deep lore Uh, was one of the things that really left me feeling dissatisfied with my first viewing of this film. It's like I disliked Frozen 2 for the same reasons I love the Transformers right at Universal Studios. It has an overabundance of characters and lore and a dearth of context. But while on the Transformers ride, I find it very funny that Bonecrusher wants the Allspark and he gets hit by a train before I learn what any of those words mean, I found it less amusing and more baffling and frustrating in Frozen 2. And some of that is definitely on me, because it did eventually all make sense on my third or fourth rewatch, so the information was clearly there, but I don't know, I guess I just needed to be spoon-fed the information a little bit more. I mean, I'm a woman in my 30s who thinks too hard about media for a living, and I was confused. The children watching this thing must have no idea what's going on. So Elsa tells Anna that she's awoken the spirits of the enchanted forest and the trolls from the first movie arrive and tell them that the past is not what it seems, a wrong must be righted, Arendelle is not safe, and a truth must be found. So the entire royal family sets off on a quest to the enchanted forest and leaves the citizens of Arendelle just hanging out on a cliffside. Along their journey, Olaf regales them with useless trivia. The relevant detail in this running bit is the idea of the memory of water, a pseudoscientific theory in our world that is very literal and true in the magical world of Arendelle and the Enchanted Forest. Olaf is unbearable in this movie. I actually had the exact opposite reaction to him that I had from the first film. Based on the trailers for the first Frozen film, I was certain I was going to hate this grotesque little snowman character, but Olaf's character introduction, the song In Summer, and the idea of a little snowman who just wanted to experience summertime was just so charming to me. The bit is good, there's so much room for comedy with that character, but it's also like a little bittersweet. Snowmen don't ever get to live to see summer! Until Olaf, obviously. I absolutely loved him in the first film, and I was excited to get to see him again in this one. And in this one, he sucks ass. His bit in this is like that he's reached an adolescent stage of semi-self-awareness and he likes trivia. I hate almost every moment he's on screen. Elsa and Olaf fall asleep in the back of the wagon and Kristoff once again tries to propose. This is just, this is gonna be the entire story arc for Kristoff. Just a runner of failed proposal attempts. I really hate it. I wish that they had either given Kristoff more to do or left him on the hillside with the rest of the Arendellians because this sucks. I'm not like a Kristoff stan or anything, like I'm not super invested in his character. I just feel like the story grinds to a halt every time we have to catch up on Kristoff's C-plot. And because this is Kristoff's entire arc and it can't be resolved this early in the movie, Anna has to act entirely out of character and, well, crazy. You think I'm crazy? In order to foil his second attempt at a proposal. They get into an argument and she makes some of her own big logical leaps. It's, it's tedious. 
Luckily, the voice wakes Elsa up, and they realize that they've arrived at what is either the Enchanted Forest or the Shimmer from Annihilation. When Kristoff tries to go in alone, he is rejected by the magical wall of mist, but the mists parted Elsa's touch, and they are allowed to enter. But once they get to the other side, Elsa tries to get back out, and they find that they are trapped. Later on, this is implied to be because Anna and Elsa are two sides of a bridge, and they need to be holding hands to pass through the mist. See? Anna and Elsa are holding hands and now they're not holding hands. The enchanted forest is beautiful. Anna spots the dam. Kristoff remarks that if it was broken, it would flood everything in the fjord, including Arendelle. And then he tries another proposal. And again, Anna makes huge logical leaps and gets into a fight with him and runs off to find Elsa. Olaf sings an in-summer analog about the scary forest that was clearly inspired by the this is fine meme that was super viral while this film was being made. This is fine. I skipped this one on the playlist too. At the end of Olaf's song, a tornado appears and Elsa stops it with her ice powers and incidentally creates ice sculptures of things that happened in the past. It's the memory of water thing. They recognize that one of the statues is their father as a boy being saved by a Northuldra girl. Then a bunch of Northuldra and a bunch of Arendellian soldiers appear and Olaf retells the whole last movie for us. Rem remember when the first movie happened, guys? Remember that? Remember how much you liked the first movie? God, I hate it when movies do this. I hate it when sequels do this so much. Anna recognizes one of the Arendellian soldiers as Lieutenant Matthias, their father's official guard, and they realize that the soldiers have been trapped in the forest with the North Uldra for, like, 30 years. Then a fire salamander shows up and sets a bunch of stuff on fire, and Elsa tames it the way she tamed the wind. And he's really cute. The North Uldra recognize Queen Iduna's scarf as a North Uldra scarf, and Anna and Elsa realize that the North Uldra girl saving their father in the ice statue was their mother. They announce to all of the North Uldra people that they just met that they are half North Uldra, and the North Uldra people just believe them and start yoking. This was another huge plot reveal that felt just super rushed for me. Like, I don't know, I wanted some incredulity from someone. And the reveal coming from Anna and Elsa themselves felt kind of hollow. I almost feel like Yelena, the North Uldran elder, should have been the one to figure out that their mother was Aduna. The entire tribe recognizes the scarf as being from one of their oldest families, but Yelena would have known Aduna when she was still a kid, right? Like maybe Yelena recognizes the scarf and then is like, oh shit, you two look identical to that girl I knew who disappeared never to be seen or heard from again on the exact same day that the enchanted forest locked us all in. I think you might be her daughters. <laughs> and then maybe Elsa is ready to accept that, but Anna isn't because they've literally been taught their entire lives to hate the North Uldra for betraying Arendelle and killing their grandfather. But, you know, over the course of the movie, she becomes convinced of the truth that Yelena already knows, and that can feed into the theme about, like, whitewashing of historical wrongs or whatever. It would make Iduna feel a lot less disconnected from this tribe if anyone actually remembered her, too. One of the North Uldra, Honey Marin, tells Elsa about a fifth spirit, said to be a bridge between humans and nature. Honey Marin's brother, Ryder, helps Kristoff try to plan a romantic proposal, and the two bond over their shared love of reindeer. Then Kristoff sings a 1980s power ballad style song about his feelings for Anna called Lost in the Woods, and listen, I love it. It's amazing and hilarious, and one of the biggest flaws in the first film was that they had Jonathan Groff, and they didn't give him a song. But the entire proposal storyline and Lost in the Woods should have been the focus of another Frozen franchise short, like Frozen Fever and Olaf's Frozen Adventure. It's so incongruous with the rest of the story, and not in a comedic relief kind of way. Either give Kristoff an active role in the story, or send him home. Anyway, in the scene following the power ballad parody, Anna and Elsa stumble upon the wreckage of the ship that killed their parents, and Elsa uses her ice powers to create an ice statue of their final moments. It's one of the most fucked up dead parent scenes in a Disney movie, right up there with Bambi and the Lion King. Also on the ship, Anna and Elsa find a map to where their parents were traveling when their ship went down, Otto Holland. They were on a mission to find the source of Elsa's magic when they died. Anna gives Elsa a pep talk, and Elsa sends her and Olaf careening down the hillside on an ice canoe, almost killing them. Well, almost killing Anna. Olaf is a snowman. 
The canoe lands in a river and in a sequence that feels suspiciously like an ad for the frozen ever after ride at Epcot's Norway Pavilion, they narrowly escape sleeping stone giants before falling down a waterfall. Anna and Olaf survive the trip down a waterfall and wander into a system of caves. Meanwhile, Elsa attempts to cross the dark sea and encounters the Nock, a mystical water horse that tries to drown her until she tames it and rides it to Otta Hollen. This sequence is the best sequence in the movie. I am so here for superhero Elsa. I will watch 100 hours of superhero Elsa. Elsa reaches Otta Hollen, which is a glacier, a river of ice, and sings a song, Show Yourself, in which she becomes Elsa the White and discovers that she is the fifth spirit Honey Marin mentioned. She also lets her hair totally down, signifying that she's finally free. And it's very good. It's most people's favorite song from the movie. Around Elsa are more memories and ice sculptures. She follows them further and further down until she discovers the truth about the North Uldra, that her grandfather, King Runard, betrayed the North Uldra, killing their leader, and that the dam he built hurt the enchanted forest. Having gone too far down, Elsa freezes to death, but not before using the last of her magic to send one last message to Anna. Deep in the network of caves, Anna and Olaf get Elsa's message, a statue of their grandfather executing the North Uldra leader. Anna realizes that the dam needs to be broken to set things right, and that the spirits of the forest force the Arendellians out of Arendelle because Arendelle will be flooded when the dam is destroyed. Then Olaf begins to die because Elsa's magic is fading, and Anna and Olaf realize that Elsa is dead. I absolutely hated Olaf in this movie, and I still ugly cried throughout this entire scene. It is one of the bleakest scenes in a Disney movie, followed by one of the bleakest songs, but my favorite song in the entire movie, The Next Right Thing. Partly inspired by the loss of Chris Buck's son, Ryder, during the making of the first Frozen film, The Next Right Thing is one of the most profound and relatable depictions of grief in a Disney film. Alone in the cave, knowing that half the people she loves are dead, Anna musters the strength to carry on living because it is her responsibility to do the next right thing. And in this case, the next right thing is to become an eco-terrorist and destroy the dam and by extension, Arendelle. Sorry. This is why I'm an honest stan. Like, I know everyone prefers Elsa because she's blonde and she has ice powers, but only one princess of Arendelle is gonna help you destroy fossil fuel infrastructure. And she'll do it with her bare hands if she needs to. She doesn't care. She's second in line for the throne, but she's first in line to smash a window. She'll Andreas on your pipeline until you mom. Anna climbs out of the cave without the help of ice powers, just by sheer force of will. And then she wakes the stone giants and begins antagonizing them and leading them toward the dam. On her way to the dam, the Fed tries to stop her, but Anna is a born leader and convinces them to help her do an eco-terrorism. Anna runs out onto the dam, and the stone giants begin throwing boulders at her, destroying the dam. Anna, Kristoff, and the Arendellian soldiers watch as the water rushes out of the dam and toward Arendelle. Unbeknownst to them, the spell is broken, and Elsa comes back to life. Elsa rides the knock to Arendelle and freezes the water just in time to save the kingdom and the castle, massively undercutting Anna's heroic sacrifice moments earlier. I don't care what anyone else thinks. Arendelle should have fallen. The past wrongs are not righted until that castle is under the waves. The Wall of Mist is lifted and the North Uldra and the Arendellian soldiers leave the Enchanted Forest for the first time in 34 years, 5 months, and 23 days. Elsa brings Olaf back to life and names Anna her successor, choosing to live with the North Uldra in the Enchanted Forest, but she comes back to Arendelle regularly to play charades with Anna and Kristoff, and Kristoff proposes at last. Anna is coronated Queen Anna of Arendelle, and a statue of young Iduna and Prince Agnar is erected in Arendelle. Our lands and people, now connected by love. The last shot of the movie is Elsa riding off into the distance on the knock. The camera lingers on her face and she gazes into the middle distance. She breathes in the salt air. She is finally free. And that's Frozen 2. Now let's talk about the Sami. Woo! The first Frozen film garnered a fair bit of criticism for its use of, let's call it Sami-coded music and imagery. The Sami are the indigenous people of Sopmi, 
an ancient region encompassing parts of modern Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia's Kola Peninsula. The Sami have lived in the region for thousands of years, but after a centuries-long process of violent systemic forced assimilation, only around 50,000 to 100,000 Sami currently remain. Although many modern Scandinavians, Finns, and Russians have some Sami ancestry, on account of the whole forced assimilation thing. YouTuber Your Way to Norway, who normally does travel advice style content, took a break from his regularly scheduled programming to make this very personal video about how his sea Sami culture and identity were stripped from him and his grandmother by the Norwegian government and by everyday Norwegians. It's worth a watch. The 2016 Swedish film Sami Blood also deals with cultural pressures on Samis to assimilate and the cruelty and dehumanization faced by the Sami at the hands of the ethnic Swedes. In November of 2013, when the first Frozen film was released in theaters, over the title sequence, like literally within the film's first few seconds, a bunch of Sami viewers were like, wait a minute, now wait a goddamn minute, that's a yoik! That's a fucking yoik! And it is. The first track in Frozen, Wei Li, samples a yoik, a traditional, typically non-verbal Sami song. Wei Li is actually another, albeit more uncommon term, for yoik. Now, Disney didn't just lift the idea of doing a yoik and make one up. Wei Li, which also utilizes a traditional Christian hymn, was written by South Sami composer Frode Fjellheim, and the yoik sampled in it is a popular yoik he wrote and released in 2002 called It Namen Wei Li. Apologies for my pronunciation. Moments later in the film, we see young Kristoff and a bunch of ice harvesters wearing outfits that look very similar to Gokdi's, Sami traditional clothing. The character of Kristoff is very Sami-coded in both films. In fact, in the original screenplay for Frozen, his character is introduced in an action line as a young Sami boy, but the word Sami is never uttered by any of the characters. Kristoff's indigenous identity is just implied. And if Kristoff is implied or stated to be Sami, then he's treated somewhat insensitively by the script. He's often implied to smell bad, which is a racist stereotype of the Sami who are often accused of being unclean by ethnic Scandinavians. Again, I highly recommend Your Way to Norway's video about assimilation. And in the song Fixer Upper, there's a lyric implying that he's a reindeer fucker. It's like one of those, one of those jokes, one of those jokes for the parents, one of those jokes they do in kids' movies that are supposed to fly over the kids' heads, but the adults in the room are like, oh, yeah, I get it. But like, reindeer are sacred to a lot of Sami cultures, and reindeer herding is a massive part of the Sami way of life in many parts of Sothmi. So it seems kind of cruel and fucked up to have a joke about your Sami-coded character being a reindeer fucker. And I think Disney realized that, because the Swedish and Norwegian dubs of the film do not include this joke. The Finnish version still does. There's also the issue of the trolls being sort of indigenous coded, like they, they live in tribes and the troll Grandpabi appears to be a shaman, and shamanism is also a Sami practice. A lot of Sami people were pleased with the first Frozen movie. A lot of them were excited to see a South Sami musician composing for one of the biggest filmmaking companies in the world. And a lot of Sami people were happy to see any representation of their culture, even if it was only implicit representation. But a lot of other Sami people, including members of the Sami Council and Sami Parliament, were kind of pissed that Disney borrowed and used parts of their culture as set dressing with no input from actual members of that culture and no respect for the elements of that culture they were borrowing. So as a bit of a mea culpa, Disney signed an agreement with the Sami Council and Sami Parliament regarding the depiction of Sami culture in Frozen 2. As part of the agreement, Walt Disney Animation Studios was required to produce a dubbed version of the film in one of the 11 Sami languages, give screen credit to the Sami people, provide learning opportunities between the studio and Sami people, and establish a Sami advisory council, similar to the Oceanic Story Trust utilized in 2016's Moana. With the help of the Verdet advisory group, Walt Disney Animation Studios made the North Uldra a more accurate stand-in for the Sami people. They wear gokdis, they drink from guksis, they yoik, and they refer to themselves as the people of the sun. The Sami worship the sun goddess, Bewe, and their flag depicts the sun and the colors of the 
Northern Lights. As part of my research for this video, I reached out to Nina Niskanen, a Finnish illustrator and folklorist with Sami ancestry, and she graciously gave me access to her Udemy course on Sami mythology. I'm going to link off to her Udemy courses and Medium account in the description. If art, folklore, or Louisa May Alcott's Little Women interests you, go check out her work and purchase some courses or subscriptions, as she writes extensively on all of those topics. In Nina's course, I also learned that Otto Holland was based heavily on Sami and Finnish myths about the land of the dead. In Finnish mythology, the land of the dead, Pohjola, is located in the far north, and in Sami mythologies, Rotaimo, as it is called, is located at the bottom of a deep lake. Atahalan is said to be a river, and Elsa discovers that it is actually a glacier in the dark sea. The name Ahtahalin is also a portmanteau of Ahto, or Ahti, the Finnish sea god, and Halla, the Finnish word for frozen. It's also very similar to the word Ahtoya, the Finnish word for packed ice. So you could also argue that it's a portmanteau of the words for packed ice and frozen. When Anna, Elsa, and the gang enter the enchanted forest, they enter through a seipa, a sacred ring of stones that the Sami treated as a worshipping place. The Sami would go to the seipa to leave gifts for the gods and to meditate. Still more from Frozen 2 is borrowed from Norse and Finnish myths rather than Sami myths. The Nock, the water horse Elsa tames, can be found in a number of northern myths, from the Kelpies of Scotland to the Nokken of Norway, where it gets its name. But again, the water horse from Frozen 2 most closely resembles its Finnish counterpart, Ikutihku, which directly translates into eternally dripping water. The Ikutihku can safely travel to and from the land of the dead, and when Elsa tames the Nock, the first place it takes her to is Atahalin. Queen Iduna's name is borrowed from Norse mythology. Iduna is the goddess of health and rejuvenation, and she's associated with the autumn season. Frozen 2 is set in autumn, and the big revelation in the movie is centered around Iduna's, and by extension, Elsa's, identity. Okay, anti-woke brigade, here's your content warning. I'm wading into some cultural appropriation waters here. If that triggers you, skip to the timecode below. In the entire Frozen franchise, there's this sort of homogenization of Scandinavian, Baltic, and Sami culture that I guess one should come to expect from a corporation like Disney. But I really feel two ways about it. Like, on the one hand, the North Oldero, while being based on the Sami people, are not Sami. And Arendelle, while being based on Norway, is not Norwegian. So this kind of blend of culture and folklore is very much in the interest of creating something new. A fairy tale kingdom with a Nordic flavor. Hugeland. But on the other hand, I get the ick about conflating Sami culture with the cultures of people who brutally subjugated them for centuries. And I get the ick from an American corporation profiting off of indigenous aesthetics for two films that never even mention the word Sami in them. I felt a little bit more comfortable watching Klaus, the Netflix Sergio Pablos joint released the same year as Frozen 2. Klaus also prominently features Sami characters, but they are stated to be Sami, are depicted as Sami, speak northern Sami, and are voiced by Sami actors. I mean, the depiction of the Sami as Santa's helpers is still a bit yikes. The Sami have a, let's say, a complicated relationship with modern Santa Claus. All I'm gonna say is, if you go to Rovaniemi to see Jolupukki, don't take any pictures of any Sami people without their permission, Try not to stay in an Airbnb, clean up after yourself for God's sake, and don't do one of those husky rides they offer tourists. Mushing is a practice from a completely different Arctic culture. Huskies are not native to the area, and they scare the reindeer. By contrast, the North Oldra are very Sami-ish, but depicted in just such a way as to be recognizably native to the average American viewer. The North Oldra were all designed with dark hair and dark complexions, which led to predictable criticism of Lily White, Anna, and Elsa claiming 116th Cherokee heritage. Which is ironic, because Sami people are pretty diverse in appearance. Some have very dark complexions, and some are towhead blondes like Elsa and would be considered white passing by American standards. So if Disney just made them look like modern Sami, Anna, Elsa, and Iduna wouldn't have been roundly mocked for their indigenous heritage in American reviews of the film. 
Instead of the Sami's brightly colored traditional gokdis, the North Uldra wear the same shade of beige Hollywood always makes Native Americans wear for some reason. And while there is a North Sami dub of Frozen 2 featuring Sami actors, in the original English version of the film, the North Uldra characters aren't voiced by any indigenous actors. Why couldn't the Sami actors for Honey Marin Ryder and Yelena voice their roles in English? Or if the Sami actors couldn't do it, why couldn't Disney have hired the indigenous American actors? Or at the very least, American actors with Sami heritage, like, oh, I don't know, Academy Award winner Renee Zellweger? Listen, Martha Plimpton is fine, but Disney's got bottomless pockets and endless resources. They, they could have done a lot better with the casting of the North Uldra. I also took issue with the North Uldra characters, um, rather light roles in the film. I wish that Honey Marin, Ryder, and Yelena could have been much more active and impactful characters to the story. You know, they have stakes too. They have skin in the game. They've all been trapped in the enchanted forest for 30 years. Ryder and Honey Marin haven't even ever seen the outside world. I wish they could have been a bit more active in their own rescue, rather than just waiting around for Elsa to figure it out. Similar to Kristoff, the North Uldra characters are just kind of there. Kristoff, remember, was Sami coded in the first film. He could totally be from another North Uldra tribe or, or some other kind of ethnic minority in Arendelle. Instead of watching Kristoff and Ryder dick around and bond over reindeer, wouldn't it be so much cooler to watch them bond over their shared heritage while they're out on a quest to help Anna and Elsa undo the curse that trapped them in the enchanted forest? Wouldn't it be so much cooler if Honey Marin had a personality? The North Ultra live in an enchanted forest and are stated as taking advantage of its gifts. Frozen 2 makes sure to tell us several times that the North Uldra aren't magical themselves because the Enchanted Forest plotline skates uncomfortably close to racist tropes about magical Native Americans, but also, I think, because the film is trying to instill a subtle environmental message about stewardship of the land. Okay, maybe not so subtle. The film is very loudly stating that the North Uldra are capable of taking advantage of nature's gifts because they're responsible stewards of the land. What's more subtle is the implicit land back narrative that gets undermined by Elsa at the end of the film. Frozen 2 is a musical, and in musicals, the emotional linchpin of the story is always a song. Usually, but not always, it's the 11 o'clock hour number, or second to last song in the show. In Frozen 2, the emotional linchpin is Show Yourself, Elsa's song of self-discovery. And to underline that, the last shot of the film is Elsa's face as she rides off on the knock and she finally looks content and free. But I wonder if there was an earlier draft of Frozen 2 where the emotional linchpin and thesis of the film was the next right thing. And in that version of the film, maybe Anna was allowed to complete her heroic mission and destroy Arendelle, and maybe the land was given back to the North Uldra and the North Uldrans and the Arendellians rebuilt something new where Arendelle once stood. And Anna would still be queen or whatever. Like I know a Disney princess movie is never going to go anywhere near abolishing the monarchy, but it really feels like Arendelle as it stood was meant to get destroyed. And that's why Elsa's rescue feels so rushed. And like, remember that lyric in the opening number, some things will never change, where they repeat the words, our flag will always fly a disturbing number of times, so you know that it definitely won't. But then it just does. It feels like there was another version of Frozen 2 where maybe a new flag was flown in place of the old Arendellian one. Maybe in a place where the castle once stood. I can imagine that if something like that were in the script, it would have been scrapped by an executive. Like, we're the Disney company, our two symbols are a rodent, and a castle. We can't have a movie where we destroy a castle. Anyway, I'm only speculating. The dam featured in Frozen 2 is also an explicit reference to the Alta controversy, a series of protests and mass acts of civil disobedience that broke out in Norway in the late 70s and early 80s following the announcement of the construction of a dam and hydroelectric plant in Sami territory that would inevitably flood the Sami village of Masi, disrupt the local wildlife, and result in the displacement of Sami people. Camps were set up outside the Alta site and indigenous and environmentalist activists occupied the construction site for years. 
activists took part in hunger strikes and laid down in front of construction equipment to prevent work. The event marked the first time since the Second World War that Norwegians were arrested and charged for rioting. At one point, 10% of Norway's entire police force was stationed at the site, forcibly removing protesters by day and sleeping on a cruise ship harbored in the Alta River by night. The issue was taken all the way to the Norwegian Supreme Court, who ruled that it was obviously okay to build the dam, and construction was completed in 1987. The destruction of the Alta Dam analog in Frozen 2 is one of the most impressive references to the Sami people to me, and I'm glad they included it in the film. It is very cool to get a Disney film that gets this close to demanding reparations and land rights for indigenous people, and I'm glad it exists, even if it's at times a little sloppy. After Frozen 2's release, plenty of Sami people were reportedly very happy with the way the film depicted the Sami people. But as with Moana in 2016, there were still indigenous people who expressed discomfort with the film. In any discussion involving what is good and bad representation and cultural appropriation, there are going to be people who view the Disney company as doing little more than repackaging indigenous cultures for mass consumption. And I think that's a valid criticism. It's a critique we should consider anytime we're talking about mass media that capitalizes on indigenous culture and aesthetics. Of Moana, Tina Ngata, a New Zealand educator and indigenous activist said, The fact remains still though that it is not an indigenous story and we have this happening throughout many types of films where we have people who it is uh, essentially a white filmmaker who gets brown advice and then they try to tout it as a brown story. But uh, Having brown advisors doesn't make it a brown story. It's still very much uh, a white person's story. Some of the very early drafts of Moana were written by Taika Waititi, but the movie we eventually got was a Musker and Clements joint. Noted white guys, John Musker and Ron Clements. Similarly, having Sami advisors does not make Frozen 2 a Sami story. And some Sami people objected to the terms of the Sami Council and Sami Parliament's agreement with Walt Disney Animation Studios. In her dissertation, Reindeer Are Better Than People, Indigenous Representation in Disney's Frozen, Kelsey A. Fuller of the University of Colorado Boulder writes of friend and Sami choreographer Marit Shireen Karolostoder's reaction to the agreement. Said Carola's daughter. What I initially reacted upon the contract is this. It is the position of the Sami that their collective and individual culture, including aesthetic elements, music, language, stories, histories, and other traditional cultural expressions, are property that belong to the Sami. First of all, why use the word property? What do we really mean by owning a culture? Isn't it rather reutilize, take back authorship of the performance of culture that is at stake here? Right to resources. Resources is also, to me, a term that is used in a capitalist market system we have all been forced into. Karola Stoder's concerns echo some of the criticisms lobbied by Ngata at Moana regarding the commodification and packaging of indigenous cultures for mass consumption. Fuller states, Disney makes billions of dollars commodifying Sami culture and music. And one wonders if the contract they signed with representatives of Sami Parliament applies to the real world as well. To that point, I woke up on the morning of December 15th, 2019 to find a message from Marit, sharing a Facebook post written by Sami scholar Maybrit Oman. She had been invited to a special screening of the premiere of the North Sami version of Frozen 2, but left in protest before the film even started because the event organization, from the invitations to the red carpet to the theaters themselves, seemed to treat Stockholm Sami Association VIPs as an afterthought, privileging instead the celebrities who were there for the simultaneous Swedish language premiere. Backing up her descriptions with photos, she wrote, No thanks, Disney and Swedish Film Institute. I don't dance for breadcrumbs. When you exploit Sami culture, then at least please make sure to show some respect for Sami. At the end of Frozen 2, a statue of young Agnar and Iduna is erected in Arendelle as a symbol of unity between the Arendellians and the North Ultra. Our lands and people connected by love. And that's nice and all, but for the actual Sami and indigenous people around the world, love isn't really enough to right historical wrongs. After generations of forced assimilation on the direct orders of the imperialist state, the Sami now face assimilation or death 
due to climate change. Increasing global temperatures have decimated reindeer populations as changes in the quality of Arctic snow has impacted their ability to access lichen, their primary food source. Going on four decades after the Alta controversy, Sami are still facing the confiscation and destruction of their ancestral lands by corporate entities in the state. February 6th is National Sami Day, an ethnic national day celebrating the anniversary of the first Sami Congress in 1917. In the description for this video, I'm going to include links to organizations like the International Work Group for Indigenous Affairs and Sami Council. In honor of the Sami people, this February 6th, I encourage you to donate to organizations that promote the rights of the Sami people. And every day, I encourage you to support the land back movements in your area. Indigenous land rights and responsible stewardship are in all of our interest. The light turned off. When did that happen? I didn't charge it enough. Oh, we're gonna ignore that. For all its flaws, I really, whoa, this one's fast. For all its flaws, I really meant it when I said I'm glad this film exists. Walt Disney Animation Studios has been moving toward telling more complicated stories for a while now, and I think that's been a pretty refreshing change for the most part. The most obvious sign of this shift in storytelling has been the increasing absence of traditional Disney villains from the narrative. And while I still love a classic Disney fairy tale, I think it's a good sign that the company has been experimenting with telling different kinds of stories. I think it's cool that the chief antagonist in Frozen 2 is like colonialism or whatever, even if the narrative is a bit clumsy at times. And I think this new generation of Disney films with less straightforward narratives like Frozen 2 really paved the way for films like 2021's Encanto, which I think shares a lot of similarities with its predecessors, but feels like a much stronger and more elegant execution of some of those more mature themes. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that Frozen 2 was a bit of a mess, but an attempt was made. A valiant attempt, even. The moments where the film stuck the landing were striking and brilliant. And for all the times it didn't, well, at least it gave me something to talk about on my YouTube channel. But I don't know, this is also just my opinion. Take it, or I guess, let it go. Hello, Missouri Valley Community Schools. It's me, Superintendent Dr. Hazing here, along with my sidekick, Raleigh. And we're here to tell you that there will be no school on Wednesday, January 22nd, due to weather. Oh, the wind's blowing a little bit colder. You'd better find your controllers, cause the snow is moving in on this chilly winter breeze. I had hoped this winter would be nicer, but now we need many snowplow drivers. That's why I must cancel school for Missouri Valley CSD. Yes, some things never change, like how the scrunchie won't go bye-bye. Some things just stay the same. Everything except my hairline, like as a man, I wouldn't own a minivan. Well, some things just aren't true. No, because I have one. But some things never change, like how I'm singing to cancel school. Soon the summer breeze will be blowing, but our students will still be going here to school because this winter will last an eternity. On the snow day, you'll be wearing your phone out. On Instagram and Snapchatting things out. Maybe you should leave it off and enjoy a 500-piece puzzle. Oh, some things never change. Like a cute little baby girl, some things just stay the same. Like this look just before she hurls. Well, as I see it, this snow's not gonna quit. From seniors to our preschoolers. Some things never change. I hope you enjoy your day off of school. Bye, everyone.